Morning, everybody. Um, I'm guessing you can all see me and hear me. Congratulations. Lucky you guys. Um, and we've got Tags joined by video as well. Hello, Tag. Morning, morning. Okay, so um, welcome to the first VTC webinar for Academia and Ratama. This is, uh, this is a new endeavor for us. So we've got, as you've probably seen, quite a few webinars going on over the next couple of weeks. Um, we're using a new platform as well, so it's going to be a bit fun uh, for us because this is the first one. Um, again, congratulations, you're all guinea pigs, yay! Um, so, in this webinar, if I get my slides up right now, we are going to be talking about remote working and how we do it as a business. Um, and what our journey was, basically. So um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm James Dancer. I'm Group Technical Director for Academia and Atama. Um, and the other guy in the video, also with glasses and also with facial hair, is Tom Abel Green, who I'll be referring to as TAG um, throughout the rest of this webinar. And TAG is one of our modern learning and workplace evangelists, which is a, a bit of a mouthful. Um, but I think that's uh, pretty, right. pretty sums you up, or sums you up pretty well, doesn't it, TAG? It does, yeah, and considerably less hair than you. <laughs> well, I was just going to say my uh, my Memoji's got a bit more hair than I have mm -hmm. at the moment, but that was uh, that was needs must. Um, so we're going to run this session for twenty to thirty minutes or so, um, and we'll hang around for Q and A at the end as well. Um, in case you haven't noticed yet, in the chat um, window in the chat box where you type your comment, there's a little bubble just above it to the top right that will probably currently be set to chat mode. Um, if you click that, that will turn it into question mode, which means that when you type something. Um, it will flag it as a question. There'll be a little red Q in a circle um, next to what you've written to give myself and Tag an idea that we need to need to answer a question. Um, if you forget to do that, it's fine. You'll still see the little circle. You can click that yourself after you've sent a message and let convert it. It will convert it to a question. And also, Ryan from our marketing team is moderating today. So if something looks like a question and he's forgotten or you've forgotten to to tag it, then he will tag it for you. So. Um, in terms of what we're covering um, in this session, it'll be our, a bit around our story um, with remote working and, and COVID and what happened to us as a business because we we had quite you know quite a seamless transition into remote working um, and we've had quite a few people ask us you know how did you guys do it what's your setup what software do you use um, and so we we thought it would be a good idea to consolidate that for you guys so you've got an idea of how we got to where we're at now um, which covers sort of things of, of what led to the infrastructure decisions as well as the mindset which is quite an important thing um, when you're sort of moving to a remote working environment and also um, the tools and software um, that we use in turn so you can have a bit of a, um, uh, you know, a bit of a behind the scenes cheat thing going on um, if you want to copy what we do. Um, so we just had a question already. I just want to uh, just want to address that one. Which conference tool is used for the webinar? So we're using a thing called Webinar Jam, which is a uh, quite a new tool. And the reason we've moved to this is one, it's got quite a few decent tools from a presenter side. So it gives you a lot of visibility of what's going on. But most importantly, it's 100% web based. So it means you don't have to download a client and play with that before you can get into the webinar. So just thought I'd cover that one off. And another feature that it has um, is Very cool called, name as well, James. What's that? Webinar Jam. Yeah, it's great, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I should be wearing a Hawaiian shirt when I'm talking yeah. about it. <laughs> so um, another feature it has is polls. Um, so again, congratulations, guinea pig crew. Um, I'm going to run a quick poll just to see, actually, this is, this is useful for us, um, just to see what your experience was in your organization um, transitioning to lockdown. So we're going to show the results at the end. If you would uh, just like to answer that, you should be able to see it in your panel on the right-hand side of the webinar right now. I'll leave that up for a little bit. There we go. We've got some answers. Awesome. Some really easy and a few pain points. I was waiting to see if anybody answered really, really terrible because we've heard a couple of stories. But, but there we go. I'll leave that up for a second longer. And there we go. Right, thank you for answering, guys. I'm just going to end that. So that is a 64.35 on a few pain points and really easy. So that's really awesome to hear. Um, it would actually be interesting for us when we get towards the end of this to find out what you guys did and what went really well for you. Um, so we'll have a have a chat about that later. So 
Moving on. Um, so COVID-19 and us, which sounds like the title of a harrowing children's novel. Um, but I thought I'd give you an idea of, of what this transition looked like. I mean, we were we were monitoring this situation and obviously what was going on on the run up to lockdown happening. Um, and we were kind of ready for it. And we were we were making sure we were watching the news and government advice and everything. And it was around tag. I think it was a, over a week before lockdown was officially triggered. We we pushed the button on it and we have go on. No, I don't have to agree with you. Like yesterday. Oh, good. That's a good good start. <laughs> <I'm behaving. laughs> uh, we'll see what happens a bit later on then, shall we? Yeah. Um, so we have as part of our ISO 27001 accreditation um, a uh, business continuity matrix. Um, and that basically is a, it kind of looks like Minesweeper. It's a grid with a lot of numbers in it. And it basically tells us if this system's down, if this system's down, if there's a problem here, here's what the, the response is. And we have a reaction number, which basically says everybody goes home. And so that's what we triggered. Um, it was one day about a week and a bit before lockdown. Yeah. Um, we made a management decision. We said, everybody take your laptops home. We don't know what's going to happen over the next 48 hours. Um, it came back in the next day. But that day, we decided to, to push the button on it, said, right, from tomorrow, everybody's working from home. And the biggest problem I think we had was a few members of staff said, actually, can we take a spare monitor home? Because while they work from home anyway, occasionally, um, you know, in it for the long haul, you, you want a bit of uh, a bit of extra desktop real estate. And the biggest problem we had with that was going under the desks and cutting the cable ties in the cable management. So we're quite proud of the fact that that's the biggest problem we had really moving to, to remote. So, um, I just wanted to go through the story of what got us there, really, and it's probably similar to some of your organisations as well. Um, maybe a bit, little bit different on the business side um, versus education, but effectively, a few years ago, we uh, we had a, a meeting. We might have been in the pub. Probably was a meeting. It was definitely a business conversation where someone asked the question, "What happens if the office blows up?" And you know, that's a pretty extreme scenario. Admittedly, we are based in Enfield Lock in North London, so that you know might be a possibility at some point. But the the overriding thing was what happens if we can't get to the office as a business? Like, what what is the scenario then? Um, or what happens if the office is damaged in some way, or there's a fire, or something like that? And while we had backups, and you know backups is great, this was about maybe eight years ago. Um, everything was going to tape, um, which meant it went away to an offsite storage facility at the end of every day. And the thought process we went through is like, what would happen in that scenario? And it's like, well, if everything's off site, great, it's all backed up. But if the office is out of action, what happens when you need to restore it? You know, you've got tapes and you've got data, but where do you put it? And then we looked at how long it would take us to provision new infrastructure in a new environment. And basically, it, it, it would just not be an acceptable scenario. So we did what a lot of organizations uh, have done and are doing and looked at how we could increase the resilience and the redundancy of the kit that we have. So the first first um, uh, step towards that was Office 365, as I'm sure a lot of you have done as well. Um, and that was sort of in the stages where Office 365 was a thing, but it wasn't as widely adopted as it is now. So we um, we used ourselves as a bit of a guinea pig. So we migrated ourselves to Office 365. We went through the the pain points you you go through on a first migration ourselves. And, and pretty much our strategy was anything we we do, we want to do ourselves because we want to learn how to do it. And we want to be able to offer support and guidance to customers to be able to achieve what we do ourselves. So we migrated to Office 365. We then went through a, um, a planning kind of schema scenario where we looked at every system we had in the business and made a decision to move that off site and move some move it somewhere redundant. So we went through the private cloud, public cloud split. So anything we could move into the public cloud that was software as a service, we did that first. And then anything that couldn't be moved into the public cloud, um, we decided we wanted our own private cloud. So we bought a bunch of tin. Um, we took space in, in several data centers in London, um, which we still have now. We actually offer that as a managed service. Um, and through that process, we also became a tier two ISP. Uh, at that point, basically, it was a, a cheaper way to get the connections we needed. Um, but the fundamental um, decision was that everything needed to be offsite in an environment that is redundant and safe and secure because the definition of a data center is interesting and i know there's you know people from various different vertical uh, markets in the in the audience today but in my opinion no asterisk not necessarily the opinion of academia limited or any subsidiaries um is that a 
a room in the basement of your building isn't a data center from a redundancy point of view, because it means that if your building is out of action, any redundancy is basically gone. So that's why we have four data centers at the moment um, in central London. They all have, not in central London, in, in the London area, sorry. Um, and they all have a number of different redundancy and security measures, as you'd expect from a data center, you know, diesel generators, giant battery banks, fuel supplies, etc. And so our rule was anything that could be public clouded, do that. Anything that couldn't, we move into a private cloud to give ourselves the same benefits as a public cloud, um, but obviously with various bits of software that aren't, aren't public cloud available. Um, so we went through that process with our business. And one of the things Tag's going to talk about is the, the mindset shift, because it's all very well doing it from a technical perspective, but there's a bit of a culture change needs to happen. When we brought Teams in, um, that was a big change. We did that pretty much as soon as Teams came out. And our staff at that point were used to going to a wonderful thing called an M drive, which I'm sure all of you have an M drive or a W drive or whatever it is. And making that move from a network drive to a cloud-based storage system that also has a bunch of chat and you know, collaboration capability was a bit of a shift. But again, we wanted to do it as soon as we possibly could. So we're ahead of the curve and we wanted to behave basically like a, a forward thinking technology company, which is what we are. Um, so from there, we then adopted pretty much everything um, Microsoft offer from a 365 perspective. So we use Power BI for our analytics, and that was previously an on-site server. Um, we make use of things like Flow and Power Apps and all of the automation tools that are in there. And we've really adopted that and, and made sure our business uses it as much as is humanly possible. Um, so it's that kind of sets the scene, I think, for what we are, uh, what we're going to talk about in the in the rest of uh, today's session. But the two most fundamental things when you're making a move to remote, as I'm sure a lot of you have found already, is it's all very well getting the technology there, but getting the users to use the technology in the right way and not making it prohibitive is also a really big point. Um, so, Tag, I know you've got you've got a lot to say about the former, certainly, or the latter, even. Yeah, I mean, it's an interesting one, really. Thanks, James. Um, I think I think. Just to put into a little bit more context, what you were talking about is that, you know, as a forward thinking uh, business, especially in the, the technology center, um, I think what's been great is that we as a business have also been able to uh, make make slight tweaks and changes. I think what we've we've learned is that there is a difference between remote working hmm. and certainly remote working in, in the scenario that we find ourselves with COVID-19, right? Because it, there are lots of different other th or there are other things that we have to consider as a remote worker, that is the fact that um, we have pets, we have uh, children, we have other members of the family doing yeah. equally the same thing. Uh, just from my perspective, you know, I, I'm very fortunate that um, you know my role means that I'm on the road pretty much uh, all of the time. Um, remote working for me was nothing new, but the, the, there are other things that I've had to learn to deal with. Um, my wife um, works in a, in a role where she has to spend considerable time on the phone as well. We've got um, two children, albeit, you know, 11 and 17. Um, I know, I don't look old enough. Um, and um, th from that perspective is that how do we separate the, the, the spaces that we use? Um, and um, the mindset there has then had to change because um, I think what we've often seen um, historically in the education space, more so than maybe business space, was... Um, we'll get mobile devices and then we'll look at how we make them work into what we need for the business. And I think what the ability that, that cloud um, computing has done, so as a business we're 365, um, and I, I probably more than ever have found out so many great little things that, that, that add to the way that I'm able to work using cloud solution, right? Um, we, we talk about the Teams communication, we talk about the storage, um, we talk about some of the uh, um, other um, kind of apps that are available, um, but but the important thing is knowing that that I can pretty much pick up a device and continue working. You know, wherever I wherever I am is. is... And you you just you want to make the point about how many devices you have, right? Because uh, no, <laughs> because, because jealousy is really bad. So, um, <laughs> I, but but my point is is that. Um, if if we look at what we're trying to achieve, whether we're a business, whether we're in education or whether we're in B two B, what what we need to make sure is that we have the ability to do the work because we have access to the data, right? And we talk about access to data. Security is is um, key. I think one of the conversations I've been having 
um, mostly with leadership teams in schools, is the security element. You know, how do we make sure that we're giving access to teachers, we're giving access to students to the content that they need, but it remains secure. Um, and and actually, from that perspective, is where we normally then have the collaboration piece around. Um, you know, being able to walk into a room to talk to another member of staff, we don't have that that option now. I've had more video calls with internal people than I probably not <laughs> sounds like I don't like people, but going to see somebody face to face, right? Because it, it's just a different way of doing it. And I think you you sent out an email very early on in the process around um, the importance and um, the necessity to make sure that we're communicating not just by making a phone call but actually using the video tools because it, it, it brings a different dynamic. One of the things that, that I probably miss the most um, when meeting customers is the the ability to interact with them face to face um, because you can gauge people very differently and I think that's that's also that mindset piece, going back to that mindset piece, is understanding that sometimes you're going to have to have or try to have a, a, a conversation with people where you don't have the same kind of environment around you and making best use of that. Um, my wife continuously tells me that I sound like um, I'm not very happy when I'm talking to people on the phone. But in person, um, and Julian, bless him, who's not with us, um, you know, who, who left a while ago, said, um, you know, if, if you smile when you talk tag, people will realize you're actually quite a happy guy. Um, and so for me, the, you know, may, remembering all of those sorts of things is really important. Um, the other thing in, in terms of training, I think, you know, you, you mentioned about um, how we were pretty much geared up for this to happen. Um, and I think we, we were absolutely were geared up. And, and I think people will be more advanced in using tools remotely than others. But the collaboration piece and the power that that brings in terms of um, the use of uh, specifically teams in this, in, you know, in our example, um, and the ability to create shared documents. You know, we've had to do it for webinars. We've had to work very closely on projects where we've had to very quickly deploy um, solutions for schools and businesses. Um, what's amazed me is the, the team effort that's gone into that without really having to do very much more than log into a shared document, right, or, or into a, a, an environment has been hugely powerful. The problem, though, is making sure that people have the skill set to be able to deliver that. And I know it's it's something that we we talk about often um, for teaching staff is how do we how do we get them up and running and continue that professional development? Because I think the stat is is that over a period of a year, a teacher specifically should probably access forty hours plus of continued CPD for it to really make a difference to their teaching and learning um, outcomes for their students. So, from a business perspective. Um, we're very fortunate that we um, make use of a, a, a VLE for, for a training platform. So um, am I allowed to say that we use that particular product? Yeah, yeah of course you can. Yeah, go for it. You know, lots of colleges, universities um, use Moodle. Um, and we, even as a business, use it internally. We, we have a really robust, um, I think, onboarding system for new starters. Um, and not only is it just about covering the use of devices, but also about the workflow of, of our internal tools. Um, and that is an ongoing process, right? I'm always learning new stuff that, that I share, that I love to share with customers, with colleagues. Um, uh, and also, um, we, we need to make sure that this, the upskilling of staff continues because, um, you know, we we put things in place and sometimes they don't quite work. And being able to kind of dissect maybe where we things are going wrong or where we need to improve mm -hmm. things is really important. And really, I, I, I know you and I have talked about this, is really a case of... Um, what what is the ultimate barrier? When do we know that we've absolutely nailed the, um, yeah. the ingredients to have that success? Um, I don't think there will always be a definitive answer, but I think you and I mentioned this a while ago, which is um, the only barrier really should be on employing somebody, the only barrier should be the fact that they're in a different time zone, right? Maybe that is the ultimate because what we've learned absolutely as a business, and, and that's talking from our perspective personally, is that I don't think there's anything right now that would limit us doing the job that we need to do to do a great support element for our customers and to continue business as usual. Yeah, and I think this goes into um, something that we said on a previous podcast that we did. I can't remember. This kind of feels like a podcast, actually, rather than a yeah. webinar. <laughs> <now, but laughs> <laughs> something, yeah, something we said previously is that if, and, and this kind of works for education and business as well, that if you had 
a third party that spoke to you about how your organization runs. So the example I usually give is a you know, an alien comes to Earth and for some reason doesn't care about anything other than knowing about your organization and how that works. Yeah. And you have to explain to them, like, we want the best people. Um, we want the highest skill set. We want to be the best organization of type we possibly can be. But everybody that comes to our organization has to live within a 45 minute commute of this specific yeah. geographical location. That doesn't make sense versus the statements that you're making. So as a business, especially, um, if you want to employ the best talent, then you have to be aware that the best talent may not live within an easily commutable distance to your office. Same thing with education. There's a lot more moving, uh, a lot more movement into remote teaching and learning. There was a bit of a direction of travel anyway before all of this happened. But I think, you know, looking forward, there's certainly going to be um, a lot more of it happening because there's been this seismic shift in having to do it. But in reality, in my opinion, that should happen anyway. It shouldn't be that we've got technology to the, the degree now where you shouldn't have to be in a physical location for you to be able to experience the same as someone who's there. Obviously, exceptions like, you know, if you're if you're in manufacturing or, you know, warehousing where there's physical work required, um, then you kind of have to do that that in physical attendance. But pretty much everything else um, that is a com uh, do this, a computer based job mm. could be done from anywhere and yeah. potentially in any time zone as well. And I think it's not just I think it's not just about time zone or location. I think it's also about family circumstances, um, yeah. because um, the reality of the world is is that there are super super skilled people or people who can offer a huge amount to a business. You know, for wh whatever business that might be, but for for whatever circumstances they may be in, they they just don't have the facility to travel or they whatever it might be. And I think again, that's the other thing that's opened my eyes is. Um, just watching not only um, my wife work, but also my daughter, you know, who's in, in, in her first year of college and my son in year six um, of a primary school is is how they've adapted to using um, the ability to work and study remotely has been phenomenal. And, you know, we live in an age, yeah. sorry, James, we live in an age where um, we, is it, we talk about instant gratification and we joke about it, but we live in, a, you know, we can always, things need to almost happen immediately. And I think, that's the other power of this is you can do things very quickly. Um, and I know that, um, yeah. so um, just to answer the couple of questions whilst they're live there is, is absolutely the webinars are um, being recorded and they will be hosted, right, James? Yeah, so after this, this is a, a lovely feature of the software we're using. Um, it will be available as a live replay. So anybody watching it will be able to see it as if they were in the, the live webinar. So and, the work flow, and then we've got another question, which is, um, about how um, workflow processes are automated. So um, I'll get to that one in a slide we've got in a second as well. That'll probably be a me thing. Yeah, we'll <laughs> um, yeah. But absolutely. And and I think, um, I guess, moving on to, to the next slide about practicing what we preach, I think what what's always been a huge thing for me about academia and how do we make ourselves different? I'm, I'm, I'm probably not suggesting that other businesses don't do this, right? Because that's unfair. But we absolutely wouldn't use something that we wouldn't allow customers to use right so yeah. um quite often um the often the things that we recommend are based on a personal experience and um you know teams as as, as you said we've been using it from the very beginning but actually there were a huge yeah. amount of people that never knew what teams were and when you talk about it people don't quite believe that that could be the reality and i know other platforms have their own versions of that yeah. um but it's become really a tool for us um a communication tool for video calls. So sure. I'll get. I'll yeah. give you. You like. I know you like a stat tag, right? So yeah. I'll give you a stat. We ran. We ran some activity reports last week. Uh oh. Um, and this is just to see, you know, platform adoption and and, yeah. and what it was. And I was sent a few private messages by the people that were doing it on on my activity. Yeah. So Friday last week, yeah. I sent two thousand seven hundred and sixty five private messages in Teams in one day. All to one. Which person. is. No, not to one person. That would be crazy. But in terms of like, you know, I'm I, okay. I'm quite a heavy tech user for obvious reasons yeah. because nerd, right? But yeah. if you look at a lot of people in our organization, there's people sending over a thousand messages a day, high thousands. There's people in the high eight hundreds, nine hundreds, and and what we found as a result of that is that using instant messaging or adopting instant messaging 
as well as calls and as well as video calls can lead to greater efficiency because an instant message you don't you're not you're not in a one to one relationship with that conversation when you're you're having an instant message conversation but it is instant so you can be having multiple conversations and that's what i do for a lot of the day if i'm not on calls and and webinars and video conferences and things yeah. like that i'll be having maybe 5 6 7 up to 10 teams conversations simultaneously which if i was on a call with each of those people then I would only be able to have a one-to-one -one relationship with that yeah. conversation. That doesn't mean I'm not paying attention to everybody else, but it means I can have a one-to-many conversation as opposed to a one-to-one. -one. And, and just on that then, so going back to the mindset thing that we, we, we kind of touched on earlier on, is just understanding that there is an etiquette around using instant chat, right? That's the whole point of it, yeah, is that you, you might be doing something else and you'll, 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 you might need a quick answer and you'll probably state that, but actually people will come back to it. Um, sharing information right just putting links into a chat or even having a video call i'm just going to send you a link to this and and that sort of stuff so going back to the mindset piece is understanding that things do work differently um from a workflow perspective and people's uh, and i think i'll highlight this and i'm you know black and white about this is we we were talking about um one of the frustrations i was having using a particular device um, and it's also that people work in different ways so just touching on the education piece we talked about um, we talk about the, the University of Westminster um, project where we, we we deployed you know thousands of devices, um, and everyone talks about what a great success that is. But you know, and I've, I've mentioned this many times before, but the success is is that people are accessing the digital content through those devices over a million times in the first year, but a million times outside of nine to five. So what that tells us is that people are using the platform and the tools available to them when it suits them the best. Likewise, whilst we have a nine to five I don't, but we have a nine to five kind of, or 8.30 to five business hours. The reality is, is I'm communicating with leadership teams at seven, eight o'clock at night. And I know you're going to- That's not just, that's not mandated. That's not a thing we require. And I, and absolutely. <laughs> and you say to me, you know, you've got to take a break. But the reality is, is that because of the stuff I do during the day and the way that I work generally, it allows me to do the work and my job to the best of my ability because mm. of the interaction I am having with the customers because it suits them and I don't equally don't expect to answer back at eight o'clock in the evening. But quite often that's the time when it suits them to work too. And so going back to the workflow, giving back to the uh, collaboration, the time zone piece a little bit in terms of, you know, around the day, if you like, is it means that people are doing the job um, more effectively because they're doing yeah. it at the time that it suits them. And that's that's the important thing. And having the flexibility to do that and having, um, we'll probably give a hands up to the leadership team in academia on that, having the ability, knowing that they accept that is really important, is really important. Yeah. So um, I'm just conscious of time. So on yeah. that note, I think uh, if we go through what we do and I just realized the uh, video window is in the wrong place for this. So one second, there we go. We should now be down the bottom. Apologies to any Atama customers we're covering that logo for the minute. Uh -huh. But um, in terms of the systems that we use, so um, for data storage, we use a combination of um, Microsoft Teams and SharePoint because there's different, different things are for different purposes. Like Teams is good as a drive in a collaboration area, whereas SharePoint, is, uh, is I'm sure everybody knows SharePoint, but you can have pages and pages can interact with the documents that sit behind them. But also if you have an area that needs to be a bit more security conscious, um, it's not as easy to add people accidentally into a SharePoint site as it is with a team. Like we like to keep our teams quite open so people can add other people into teams if they're given the permissions. But one of the wonderful things with teams is that if you share a document that's in a team repository, that person gets added to the team. So in certain, for certain types of documentation, um, we use SharePoint if we need it to be really highly restricted. So there is a, there isn't a one size fits all in terms of what we use. It, it's, it's the right thing um, for, uh, the right context. Um, so OneDrive, we yeah, it's a personal storage area. That's pretty straightforward. Yep. But one thing we do that is a little bit unique is we use a product called Folder, um, um, it, which is it's awesome to basically access what would be internal network drives, but as if it was a cloud um, service. So a little bit about, I'm not going to go into folder in much detail, but basically that, that M drive scenario that we spoke about before, we have a couple of network drives still in our infrastructure because um, like our ARP system needs a drive to hang off the back of it for things like purchase order entry and stuff like that. But our staff need to access that outside 
the office. So we have folder running in our environment, which we point at our storage. It pulls in all of the um, the user account um, ACLs, the access control lists, and permissions, and all of that kind of stuff, and presents it to users remotely, either in a web browser or in an iOS or Android app, or as a network drive on their local machine. But they don't have to be VPN'd in to, to do it. So we're, we're trying to eradicate VPN as much as is humanly possible in lieu of services that are uh, um, available via the cloud and securing them to a, um, a sufficient degree. So I can get onto that in a little bit as well. So yeah. Folder, if you haven't heard about it, definitely have a have a look into it. Sorry, also, there's a myth about Folder. I'm sure NASA tested it. I'm sure that's what I heard years ago. I don't know uh, if we're allowed to say that, but yeah, well, there's definitely, it definitely, there's definitely there we go. Um, yeah, but, yeah, there we go. <laughs> so um, in terms of collaboration and stuff we use, so we've got Microsoft Teams is a really obvious one. Um, I have a big um, personal thing about video calling. And as much as, believe it or not, I really don't like being on video myself, which is weird to be said by a guy who's currently doing a webinar on a video um but from a things like a mental health perspective it's really important because if you just talk to a disembodied voice at the end of a phone all the time you can't pick up on things like expressions reactions micro expressions all of the the interaction that makes an uh, a human interaction human effectively so we encourage video calling wherever possible as much as it may be a bit uncomfortable the calluses are building up now people are using it a lot more and it's being embraced a lot more than it was previously so um despite my own my own personal feelings about when i have to go on video calls i make sure every single call i'm on i'm on a video call just because even if the other party isn't then they can at least see my face and see how I'm reacting to what they're saying because it gets my point across a lot better and lets them know a more honest emotional response from me than just whatever I happen to say at the end of the phone. So I've got a bit of a personal thing about that. That's not that's not what this is about. Um, I put Power BI as a collaboration tool, which is an interesting one. Um, Power BI, if you haven't heard of it, is a, a business intelligence and reporting system that can basically take any data from anywhere and put it into fancy reports and dashboards and the reason I put that in collaboration is we now have the ability for any any member of staff who has access to a dashboard to look at it from anywhere and look at real rich insights into our company data, but also collaborate on that dashboard within Power BI. So you don't have to go in a chat and go, right, here's a link, and I think this should change, or that's interesting about this data. You can make a note on the dashboard itself. So we actually use that as a collaboration tool as well as just a reporting tool. Um, so in terms of management, Azure Active Directory is, you know, it's not our primary. We still have um, uh, Windows Server domain controllers in our infrastructure, but any of the public cloud apps we use, our mandate is it needs to link into Azure Active Directory. And the reason for that is we can then use um, the Enterprise Mobility and Security Suite and enforce things like multi-factor authentication. So even um, Tag mentioned Moodle earlier, and that's the, the system we use for, to deliver training internally. That hooks into Azure Active Directory. So we expose that to the world. Anybody can go to the you know our, our Moodle training site and anybody can try to log in, but unless they have that second factor authentication, they can't get in, obviously. That is a lot better from a user experience than having to go to a VPN and then going to the link via a VPN. And if there's a problem with a VPN, they can't get to the resource. Um, we prefer everything in to, be, to be in Azure AD for that exact reason. We have a unified set of um, uh, conditional access controls. And we have a unified set of multi-factor authentication requirements. And as soon as you hook a system into Azure Active Directory, it's automatically applied to that system, whether that system has the capability or not. So we have a big mandate to, to do that for every, every supplementary system we use. Um, we also use Microsoft Intune to manage our Windows devices. And we use a thing called Autopilot. If you haven't heard of Autopilot, that's um, zero touch automated deployment. So we can ship a device straight from distribution um, to an employee's house. Um, and all they do is fire it up, connect it to the internet, answer a couple of questions, and that machine then goes and registers itself, um, starts installing software, um, apply security policies, et cetera, et cetera. So we can deploy Windows machines anywhere, anytime, to any location, um, which has been really, really, really helpful, as you can probably imagine, during this particular period. Um, so on the Mac side of things, obviously, we're a, we're a dual platform house. Um, or a multi-platform house. We use Jamf Pro, um, which is the mobile device management solution of choice, or ours anyway, for the Apple platform. So all of our Apple devices are managed by Jamf Pro. Same rules apply via um, device enrollment in the Apple world. Um, we can deploy uh, an Apple device anywhere in the world to anybody, 
straight out of the shrink wrap and all they need to do is fire it up, put in some details, connect it to the internet and it goes and deploys automatically. So that middle slice, that management slice has meant that us transitioning to work from home has meant we actually deploy from home or to home exactly the same as we deploy in an office. So because it's all internet based and remote management based, the restriction isn't where the person is. The restriction is just that we've got to have an admin to do some stuff to configure it in the first place. Um, in terms of communication, obviously, you don't need to talk about Teams, but from a uh, phone system perspective, we use Ring Central, and that meant that when everybody had to go home, nothing was different. Everyone has headsets that they plug into their laptops. Uh, everyone has the mobile app for Ring Central, so our phone system is completely distributed. I've heard loads of stories about people in in our industry, other businesses who were panic buying mobiles when all of this started because they had an on-premise ISDN-based phone system um, and didn't have a way for their staff to actually work from home um, or certainly communicate from home. And even when you've done that and panic bought mobiles, that doesn't really help that much because then you don't have a system sitting behind it. So the point, point of us putting Ring Central in is that we would be cloud-based and at any point, anybody in our business could go and pick up their device, go to wherever they needed to go, um, and and carry on working as if they're in the office. Um, and the final thing I mentioned is the the from a workflow perspective, we use a system called Epicor as our ERP or Enterprise Resource Planning System. That's kind of the core of our business, and it isn't a public cloud-based application. Um, they apparently have some stuff coming later down the line that has web access and everything. But currently, it requires a client app on a device on a Windows device. Um, and that needs to have direct communication with the server. That is the only system that requires a VPN in our infrastructure now, and that's in our data center. Um, it's also high availability and you know, all of the, uh, the wonderful disaster recovery stuff that comes with that. But once that web interface part has been released, which I'm told is towards the end of the year, maybe a bit later now, um, that then means that every single system we have doesn't need a VPN. VPNs are completely gone from our environment. So that's, we're nearly there. We are very, very close to being there. And then we can the other point, beach, can't we, James? <laughs> we did actually have one of our members of staff for a couple of years working from Portugal. Yeah, his family are from there. So he moved yeah. over to Portugal um, and carried on his job as normal. Um, and if anybody of you have dealt with him, it'd be interesting to know if you knew that was the case when you were dealing with him. Yeah. Um, so the point about all of this is we practice what we preach, right? So, um, Ultimately, we have installed and we maintain all of these systems ourselves. So if you need any help with anything like this or you're interested in any of this stuff that, that we do, do contact us. We have knowledge and expertise skills, all the salesy talk in-house to be able to help you. But we wanted to give you an idea of, uh, well, for two reasons. One, because I find it quite interesting to find out what other organizations do and have done in this scenario because there's a lot of different ways of doing it. Um, and two, Lots of businesses are giving out a don't worry, we're okay during this period message. Yeah. Um, we genuinely are. There has been very little effect. In fact, in our office right now, the only people that are in are people who physically can't do their job anywhere else. So like our warehouse manager, for example, is in to accept goods in. Yeah. Like, and I think that's I think, all we have. I think just on just to add to what you just said there, James, about you know we, we're absolutely there to support customers. It's also not just about the technical piece. Um, I think... I think what I've seen is that once people are um, are open to knowing that there's also the support there for change management and also looking at what workflow might look like. And, you know, I've supported both our Atama business and our academia business in terms of talking to customers about what could be achieved and how do we get to that point is, is as equally as, as important. And, and the great thing is, is we then have essentially two expert strands that we can support customers on both from a technical piece and the hardware piece but also from how do we get from step a to step b and all i would say is that that line is not linear right it's, it's a forever it's, it's forever changing um and the support is there on both elements yeah absolutely um so where are we? Questions. So we've uh, we've got one question that we didn't answer or I didn't answer. So if you've got any other questions for us, we're gonna gonna start wrapping up shortly. So feel free to uh, to stick those in chat. I wonder, I wonder if anyone's uh, prepared to to ask it verbally and on a video rather than <laughs> we do have that ability. Video. Yeah, you if can you uh, speak. Your, if you want to raise your hand to speak, if you've got a question, we're more than happy to take it that way. If not, um, anything in the chat sequence will work as well. I will make the point that these webinars are recorded, so therefore you will be on the recording. I just want to make that completely clear. That's a, does that count as a GDPR statement? Maybe. Um, I don't know. 
so question about workflow processes. Um, so we've had a run over the last few years about basically automating everything. The general rule internally is if someone has to do it repetitively and there isn't a specific line or metric for that, but if it's a task that feels repetitive, then we automate it. So even, even things like receiving emails and stripping attachments off and filing them in folders, actually you can use folder for that. There is a feature where you can give an, a, a folder an email address, you send emails to it, it notices there's an attachment, it then strips the attachment from that email, renames it based on your naming conventions, sticks it somewhere that's um, that's you know denoted by the workflow and the user's notified that this document is now here. Um, same thing with our, our internal systems. We integrate as much as is humanly possible. So from a CRM perspective, we use a thing called Microsoft Dynamics, which I'm sure a lot of you have heard of. Um, we kind of sound like Microsoft fanboys now, but we're very much, you know, you do. When it comes to platforms. Um, but what that allows us to do is hook into platforms like Webinar Jam, for example. So we we know that you guys have accepted invites. That's the whole thing. Um, and as well as that, we feed data from Power BI, sorry, from Dynamics into Power BI. That's all automated reports once it's been set up. Um, we have automations and triggers on our ERP system. So pretty much the rule of thumb in our business has been at any point, anybody can raise their hand and say, this is a boring, repetitive task. Can we automate it? And provided the question's been asked and it's feasible, we we go and do it. But the methodology kind of varies depending on the system. The one point I will make is um, Microsoft Flow, or now called Power Automate, is really awesome. We have a lot of um, Power Automate flows, and it's product terminology now. Product uh, we have, we have a lot of Power Automate flows in our business that will take data from one place and put it in another place and reformat it in the process. So if if you guys have Office three six five and you haven't looked at Power Automate, please 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 do because it's really easy to get automations uh, set up and and running. So. Um, yeah, the automation for us is it depends on the platform, um, but our general approach is we automate everything we possibly can. For everything else, there is Microsoft Power Automate. Um, so I don't know if there are any specific. There's one more. There's a task. Is task management also done? Ah, task management. Okay, very good point. So um, from a task management perspective, we use a couple of different systems. Um, so we have Microsoft Planner, um, which is again, part of the Office 365 suite that is based on a uh, Kanban methodology. So if you haven't seen that before, everything's in kind of buckets and lanes like that, and you move task from one to another, that tends to be where we, um, where we do collaborative projects. So if a team is working on something and work comes in, it progresses along different stages and it goes out again. Um, that's where we tend to use Planner. So from a, a senior management team perspective, we use that for our quarterly planning sessions. So each member of our senior management team has their own planner that feeds into a central plan. Um, and then anybody else uses it as appropriate. For personal tasks, um, we use Microsoft To Do or some people do. The option is to use Microsoft to do, which integrates with Outlook tasks automatically as well. So depending on how you work and depending on um, what your day to day looks like, if all of your tasks are team based, you'll use Planner as a uh, as an academia group or a timer employee. Um, if you just have a load of personal tasks of you know things you would rather have in a system than have unread emails for, that's what Microsoft to do is for, um, and that's part of the part of the suite and part of the set. Um, so another question here then, in relation to the folder product, in terms of pricing, et cetera, are we approved, are we, is Academia an approved partner for education and routes procurement, my license model per user or enterprise level site agreement? So yes, we are a folder partner. Um, for everything we've spoken about, we are we are partners for. Um, Tag and I are also quite close to the, uh, the CEO slash lead developer of Folder. We've known him for quite a while, um, which is one of the reasons we, we really love the product because a lot of our feedback has actually been built into the product. Um, so yes, um, if you want to talk about Folder, you can- um, I think it's a follow up conversation yeah. actually um, for Terence. Um, we'll, we'll follow that up because there's, there's quite a lot of information we can give you. Um, so we'll, we'll deal with that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and there's various pricing models depending on use case. Yeah. Um, so another question, if you have a OneDrive in SharePoint, then what do you use Folder for? Any examples? Okay, so a couple of different examples. One, as I mentioned earlier, we do have some, some legacy style network drives, um, Windows, DFS, SIF shares kicking around, um, that for whatever reason, that data can't go into 
OneDrive or SharePoint. The, the most basic example is our ERP system, which has to have a network drive to look at. It doesn't work with Teams or SharePoint, although apparently coming soon. Um, and that needs to be accessed outside our infrastructure as well. So we use, we use Folder to bridge the gap. So Folder looks at the network drive and presents that to the users in a, um, a unified cloud-based environment. It looks similar to the likes of OneDrive, Dropbox, SharePoint, et cetera, but the data that sits behind it is sat on a, a network drive. The other thing it can be used for, and again, this is down to user choice. So we enable the choice and it's whether users want to do this or not, um, is Folder Connect as a, uh, a consolidation tool for your storage. So one sees um, network drives, sees internal network drives and things like that. It also understands OneDrive, um, Google Drive, Amazon S3, Dropbox, Box, uh, Azure Storage, Blobs, basically you name it, it's there. Um, so that if all of those accounts are connected, when the user logs in, then they just see a, a space with all of their various storage locations in one place, which is actually really useful. I think, Tag, you use it for that, right? You have... You uh, I, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, um, I, yeah, so I've got um, I've got all, all the drives that I need to be connected to it. But I think the great thing is it's like either app-based or, or web browser-based, and I think that's what's the power behind it. Um, and, um, yeah, the... the I guess the biggest thing from your perspective is that there are no security or permission changes, right? From an from active directory perspective. So, yeah. I mean, you can tweak security permissions if you want to, but by default, it inherits the permissions from wherever the source is initially. So you can, and our, our initial test before we, we started doing tweaks, you can get folder set up in about 10 to 15 minutes. You deploy yeah. it as a template virtual machine in your infrastructure well, and it's, connect it and it's it's done. It's there. It's a, it's a great hybrid solution as well for, for, for those wanting to take the step to essentially a more cloud solution. Um, but it's it, it's a stepping stone to that as well. So, um, mm -hmm. James, I know we've got one more question. Uh, we're conscious of time as well. Um, in the transition to the cloud, did you find your overheads went up considerably or was it a gradual adoption? Because it's often uh, tricky to justify these types of transitions to the whole of the purse strings when we're done seeing potential productivity boosts are not a priority to them. Yes. I think, I think that's a mindset thing in the last instance, that, that last piece. Um, yeah. But yeah. Yeah, go on, you, you go on. Yeah, so I think, uh, as Tag said, there's, a, there's definitely a mindset shift and, and people are being forced into a different mindset right now. There is a bit of, I'm sure in, in the IT industry, there's loads of I told you so conversations going on at the moment, but that doesn't really help anything. Um, from an overheads perspective, interestingly, if you do the ROI calculations and you in, um, you include everything that is actually related in the ripple effect to doing this kind of stuff. You're not just talking about how much does my tin cost and I bought it five years ago. So therefore right now it costs me nothing apart from depreciation versus oh, there's a subscription service there. If you look at the TCO of that kit, the power and the cooling that's required for that kit to, to happen ongoing, the support of that kit, the warranties of that kit, the potential that if that dies, you need a redundant amount of kit as well. Um, and then you look at the um, productivity gains you get by having a system or systems that are accessible anywhere, anytime on any device. You can then look at things that are um, around like BYOD or CYOD. Um, so the other side that you get is if users want to use their own devices, they absolutely can. So to give you an example right now, I'm, I'm not on a work machine when I'm doing this. Um, I'm on a, yeah, don't worry, it's all secure, it's fine. Um, I'm on a Windows machine. I'm not gonna say what it's used for because it'll make me look like a nerd. Um, but the, the point is, I, I still have my work Mac right next to me. Um, I'm on my personal Windows machine right now. And for me to get online and work, I sign into stuff on web browsers. That's all I need to do. I have a, a, an app on my watch that alerts me when I need to um, to approve an MFA token, and that resets every seven days. Um, that's the maximum amount of time we allow. We, we disallow that on some systems as well. Um, so when I log in, I hit approve, I'm in, and it's all there. Um, so the whole point isn't, isn't just about the specific ROI and overheads of the kit versus a system. To get this right, you do have to model the finances out quite wide. And we went through a um, long internal education process with our, our senior management team initially to get them in the right mindset. And it, it, it pays off. It really does. And I think just, just to, to top that, that, the end of that question really also is that um, I, I think we talk a lot, certainly in the education space, about reducing teacher workload. And I think the COVID situation actually what has done is probably increase the teacher workload. But the longer term benefit is that when we go back to what is the new normal, 
a lot of these procedures will be in place. And so the, the ROI savings or, or the, the headcount savings and everything else that comes into play will eventually, you will see a sustainability option there available. Um, yeah. It's just getting to that bit. And sometimes you, you do have to invest to get to where you want to get to, but it's about the long game, right? It's about the longer term potentials. Um, and um, I'm, I'm just lastly talking to a lot of, lot of customers who are, who are knowingly aware that they're potentially not going to be spending the amount of money they would do traditionally on facilities and that sort of element. And therefore the cost element of getting up to speed into a cloud solution and a cloud workflow and everything else is going to pay off long term. And it's not, yeah. it's not the flick of a switch. It's absolutely not. And it, and I would, it's a broad set of shoulders, right? It's not, it's not easy. So yeah. I think the final thing to mention on that is the the holder of the purse strings conversations are always always tough when all, what they're looking at initially is spreadsheets. Um, but one thing we're really good at as an organization is helping you with those conversations. So we have a number of different members of staff where we don't have this as a chargeable service, but if you want us to attend, um, we've done this before, senior management team meetings, even board meetings, or just have a one-to-one -one meeting with the person who's holding the purse strings and help you get that ROI and justification across, we're here to do that. You just you just need to ask us to do it and we'll obviously have a bit of qualification I, love those I find I, I actually really do as well because I, I always expect people to come back with but about this and yeah. they think it's a unique question but we've heard it a million yeah. times before and we know exactly what to say so and I think the other the other thing just to, just to finalize this um because your half hour has gone into 57 minutes yeah we've, run, we've we've done questions is, we've run a there's always there is always a solution to a problem right it's whether we want to adopt it or not and I think that's that's a conversation that needs to happen and if you if you're aware of all of the facts then you can make a very informed decision um yeah and that's, that's where we want to get to absolutely um, so should we move on to that just that schedule um just that i guess the yeah yep, final thing so you've got uh got a few seconds now if you want to scan the qr codes that should work on on your mobiles um to get to the vtc page if you don't know where it is or can't remember where it is um so we're currently at fully remote working how do we do it i'm not going to go through all of these in in detail but if you if you skimmed around the pages and only had a look at a couple of them um there are some really 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 useful things yep. there some stuff i'll call out that relate to this um, in terms of uh, things that we've mentioned. Uh, so uh, managing Mac logins remotely with Azure AD, that is a really, really, really good one to look at if you don't do that currently. Um, modern working with Ring Central, that's obviously about the phone system we use and uh, how that fits into a modern working uh, platform. Uh, accessing Rappel Estate remotely, um, there's going to be a good amount of content there um, about how if you have Macs internally that need to be used externally, um, but can't leave the building. We have some solutions for that. Um, accessing on-premise files remotely, that's about folder. So if you're interested in folder, definitely, definitely, definitely sign up to that you one. You realize you're actually mentioning every- Yeah, I know there's one. most of uh, There's a couple if of missed out. It's fine. That, then I'm just going to say, going back to the purse strings one, <laughs> a really good one that says finance <laughs> fund your tech project. Very good point. Yours truly. So um, that'd be a really good um, kind of discussion yeah. around. <laughs> Uh, the funding models that are available. So we're basically saying just watch everything. It's yeah, uh, they're going to be always, they're all, they're all hugely resourceful. Um, and yeah. I think that, that they've all got value and they will all tap into somebody within an organization that, that adds benefit. Um, having said that, if you're not able to attend, they will be recorded, but we'd love to have you live. And, and most importantly, just know that if you miss the recording and you miss the live option, that there is a phone available and we're more than happy to have these conversations over the phone and uh, eventually in person. Absolutely. Right. So um, we're going to outro now, um, but Tag and I will stick around in chat for a little bit of time afterwards if you've got any other questions you wanted to ask us. So we'll, we'll be sort of five or 10 minutes. Um, but thank you, everybody, for attending. Um, and we'll see you on the next one. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you. Cheers.